Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm continuing my analysis of George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire book series with a look at Aria 1 in Game of Thrones. I'll link the playlist for the entire book series below. Now let's dive in. This one opens with a depiction of the sharp contrast between Arya and Sansa. Arya's stitches were crooked again. She frowned down at them with dismay and glanced over to where her sister Sansa sat among the other girls. Sansa's needlework was exquisite. Everyone said so. Sansa's work is as pretty as she is, Septim Ordain told their lady mother once. She has such fine, delicate hands. When Lady Catelyn had asked about Arya, the Septa had sniffed. Arya has the hands of a blacksmith. Sansa is fit for the role of what is expected of a woman in this world, but Arya isn't. What's interesting, though, is that Martin also points out that perception counts as much as reality, with this excerpt. Arya glanced furtively across the room, worried Septa Mordain might have read her thoughts, but the Septa was paying her no attention today. She was sitting with Princess Marcella, all smiles and admiration. It was not often that the Septa was privileged to instruct a royal princess in the womanly arts, as she had said when the queen brought Marcella to join them. Arya thought that Marcella's stitches looked a little crooked too, but you would never know it from the way the Septa Mordain was cooing. Marcella can't compare to Sansa either with needlework, but since she's a princess and she also carries herself in a way that is expected of a girl, unlike Arya, Marcella is given a pass. The girls then begin to swoon over Joffrey and Sansa one day marrying him. And this leads to my favorite exchange in the chapter. She looked at Arya. What did you think of Prince Joff's sister? He's very gallant, don't you think? John says he looks like a girl, Arya said. Sansa sighed as she stitched. Poor John, she said. He gets jealous because he's a bastard. He's our brother, Arya said much too loudly. Her voice cut through the afternoon quiet of the tower room. Once again, Arya separates herself from the other girls with what in their world is a jab at Joffrey, that he's like a girl. Also, we saw in John's POVs that he was very perceptive with people. So this again demonstrates that he feels something is off about Joffrey that many others, particularly these young girls, aren't picking up on. It's also telling to see how loyal Arya is to John. She quickly defends him, raising her voice, something that Septa Mordain isn't going to look well upon, particularly with Princess Marcella there. Also, we see Sansa's dismissive attitude toward John. Everything is through the lens of him being a bastard. And because of that, his opinions are less valued to her. He's beneath the rest of the family. Sansa even goes on to add that John is just their half brother. This all eventually boils over and leads to Arya running from the other girls. She has animosity toward her sister because she has everything. She's pretty, knows how to dress, can sew, dance, and sing, and all Arya can think about is how Jane Poole used to call her Arya Horseface. Jane Poole is also first introduced in this chapter and will play a significant role in the story later on. In the TV show, she was only briefly in season one, and then the character was not used after that. Arya then runs into her direwolf, Nymeria. The wolf pup loved her, even if no one else did. They went everywhere together, and Nymeria even slept in her room, at the foot of her bed. If mother had not forbidden it, Arya would gladly have the wolf to needlework, let Septa Mordain complain about her stitches then. Arya had named Nymeria after the warrior queen of the Roin, who had led her people across the narrow sea. That had been a great scandal too. Sansa, of course, named her pup Lady. Again, we get the contrast between the two sisters in the naming of their direwolves, and some foreshadowing here in Arya becoming a fighter herself in naming her pup after a warrior queen. Arya then goes outside to the yard where the boys are practicing at swordplay. She runs into John, and we quickly see what their relationship is like. John grinned, reached over, and messed up her hair. Arya flushed. They'd always been close. John had their father's face as she did. They were the only ones. Rob, Sansa, and Bran, even little Rickon, all took after the Tullys, with easy smiles and fire in their hair. When Arya had been little, she'd been afraid that meant that she was a bastard too. It had been John she had gone to in her fear and John who had reassured her. 
They watch the younger boys drilling at first, Bran and Tommen. Arya remarks that she could do just as well as Bran, and John teases her a bit about her size and ability to fight. It's all, though, in an easy, good-natured, and familiar way. There's also some insight here provided about the Lannisters when John points out Joffrey's surcoat. The arms were divided down the middle. On one side was the crowned stag of the royal house, on the other, the line of Lannister. The Lannisters are proud, John observed. You'd think the royal sigil would be sufficient, but no. He makes his mother's house equal in honor to the king's. This is also a little Easter egg, and that we'll soon come to learn that all of Cersei's children are not Baratheons, but fully Lannister with her brother Jaime. Sir Roderick asks if Prince Joffrey and Rob want to go another round. Rob eagerly accepts, but then in typical Joffrey fashion, he says, This is a game for children, Sir Roderick. Theon then shouts that they are children, and Joffrey comes back with, Rob may be a child. I am a prince, and I grow tired of swatting at Starks with play swords. You got more swats than you gave, Joff, Rob says. Are you afraid? Joffrey then taunts behind the safety of the Lannister men. John observes accurately, saying to Arya, Joffrey is truly a little shit. Joffrey then calls for live steel, which although Rob eagerly agrees to do, Sir Roderick is never going to allow. It's likely, too, that being a prince, Joffrey recognizes this and is just grandstanding, knowing he won't have to actually fight with a real sword. At this point, the hound steps forward and says, This is your prince. Who are you to tell he may not have an edge on his sword, sir? Sir Roderick, though, holds his ground and says, Master of arms at Winterfell, Clegane, and you would do well not to forget it. Rob tries to persuade Sir Roderick, but to no avail, and Joffrey continues to hide behind others, knowing his taunts and boasts won't need to be backed up. Joffrey says, Come and see me when you're older, Stark if you're not too old. At this, the Lannister men laugh. It gets tense, and Theon has to hold back Rob. As everyone disperses, there is a nice exchange between Arya and Jon, as she now has to go back inside. Jon jokes around with her about having to do needlework. Arya didn't think it was funny. I hate needlework, she says with a passion. It's not fair. Nothing is fair, Jon said. This was a great way to close the chapter as Arya went in and is going to have to face both Septa Mordain and her mother. These pages were all about a lack of fairness, from how Arya was perceived with the other girls and Septa Mordain, Jon's treatment as a bastard, to Joffrey being able to needle Rob and not face any consequences for his rude and childish actions because he's a prince. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to hit the like button. And if you're interested in more on A Song of Ice and Fire and House of the Dragon, listen to Caraxes and subscribe. I want to thank everyone for watching, and I'll see you soon.